and uh, thank you for being here with us this afternoon at this online event with David Grossman and Magda Gradinaru about the novel um, Life Plays With Me that was published at the beginning of this year in Romania at uh, Polyron Publishing House. Uh, we're honored to have David Gross Grossman with uh, us here, uh, the best-selling author of numerous works which have been translated into 36 languages. Uh, his novel, A Horse Walks Into a Bar, was awarded the International Man Booker Prize in 2017 and was shortlisted for the TLS Risa Dom Borges Prize to, in 2019. Uh, David Grossman is also the recipient of the French Chevalier de l'Ordre des Arts de des Lettres and the 2010 Frankfurt Peace Prize. Hello, Mr. David Grossman, and thank you for accepting our invitation. I'm glad that you have uh, invited me. Thank you. And uh, Magda Gradinaru, senior editor at spotmedia.ro, uh, journalist both concerned with uh, culture and politics. And uh, Magda's best occupation is the question. So Magda, the mic is yours. Thank you, Raluca. Thank you, Raluca. I am very glad to have this dialogue with uh, Mr. David Grossman. And of course, I will enjoy the privilege of uh, asking him questions. Welcome, David Grossman. But first of all, I would like to invite him to read a few words in Hebrew from his book uh, translated into Romania. Good. So before we say a word, I just want to have the Hebrew to echo in Timishwara. Raphael was born in 15 years old when he met his father and he got him from his father. He fell on the ground of the kibbutz that he was in the middle of the kibbutz. טוביה, אביו של רפאל, מרר בבכי. שנים טיפל באשתו במסירות, ועכשיו נראה אבוד ומיותם. רפאל, במכנסיים קצרים, עמד נבדל מהאחרים, וכיסה את ראשו ואת עיניו בקפוצ'ון, שלא יראו שהוא לא בוכה. הוא חשב, עכשיו שהיא מתה, היא יכולה לראות את כל הדברים שחשבתי עליה. Thank you. Uh... I must say from the beginning that I'm, I've been waiting for this opportunity for a long time. So I have many questions. <laughs> I start with my first. After reading uh, Life Plays With Me, translated into Romania by Polyron Publishing House, I felt the need to return to another of your books that I read many years ago when I first discovered you actually, and um, I became your reader. It was the French edition of uh, See Under Love in French of Voici de Sous Amour. Uh, I believe it's translated uh, into Romanian too. Uh, in those two books, uh, there is someone who rewrites a story. Uh, on the one hand, we have this boy, Momik, who tries to write the story of Wasserman, his uh, not grandfather, his uh, uh, uncle. A, a great uncle. A great uncle. And uh, on the other hand, we have this girl, Gilly. Uh, she's yeah. a script girl who rewrites a story using her camera. So David Grossman, what does a storyteller add to, or on the contrary, take from the, from the reality of the fact as they happened when he writes his story? It's a big question. Uh, I think in every book that I've written, there is somebody who is telling a story to a listener. And uh, I somehow believe that if you tell a story an old story, if you tell it in a new way, suddenly things changes uh, in reality, in yourself. Because you see, I think every one of us, we have a kind of a legislative story that we tell other people that we meet. Usually it's a story about our childhood and how, how our parents misunderstood us and about our siblings or our teachers. Usually these stories, they have some amount of insults that can never be repaired. And they, they are meant to arouse the sympathy to us when we tell it to new acquaintances. Uh, but sometimes we do not realize, recognize, to what extent we became prisoners of our legislative story. Because, you know, at a certain age, you might look back at the story that you always tell others, and you should ask yourself, is it really reflecting myself now? Is this story loyal to me now? Or 
Maybe it has became, become my prison. Maybe it prevents me from being much more flexible in my own life, more open. Uh, maybe I can tell the old story, but I will move a little within the text of this story, within the point of view of the story. And I will see not only myself as a child, but also my mother. Maybe I will suddenly understand that even mama had a mama. And also Papa had his own Papa and his own psychology and his own stories that he was trapped in. So uh, if you tell an old story and you, and you have a good listener, this is a very important condition. If you have a, a, a listener who can be like a midwife that will bring this baby story to the light, to, to, to real life, to reality, then suddenly you can be released from a story that has uh, fossilized you. And by the way, I spoke about individuals and how they can be trapped in their own story. But also countries and nations, they, they have their uh, legislative uh, story and they, they need it. Of course they need it because in the beginning of a nation, everybody needs a, a strong story, mythological story that will mm -hmm. say how wonderful we are and how, how awful are our enemies and how we fought for our independence and all our highly appreciated values. But maybe if we look after some years or some decades, we look at these stories and we understand that they became our prison, that they prevent us from changing our existential situation, that they do not allow us, for example, to make peace with our enemies. So telling story is, is a, a very important primal thing in the life of, of people. You know, I asked you this because it seems to me that you give a chance to the protagonist and to his biography by entrusting the story to a storyteller, to a third party. For example, we have Vera with her superimposed lives. She's an extraordinary stepmother, but at the same time, a natural mother who at one point in her life made a hard choice and not in favor of her daughter. Uh, in communist Yugoslavia, during Tito's dictatorship, she chose to go to the Gulag, to the Goliotok, it's an island of re-education, and here in Romania, we understand very well uh, what this re-education was about. So she chose to go to Goli Otok, although theoretically she could have betrayed her husband and stayed with her child. Do you all need, I don't know, someone else to change the anger at which our lives can be seen or told? And how does it feel like, David Grossman, to have this power of giving the second chance? Ah, that's the, the great gift of literature, that it gives us a second chance. Usually in life, we do not get a second chance. We make a mistake and quite often we pay heavily for it and we leave behind us scars and wounds, which are very difficult to heal. But literature, first it shows us the way to, to recover from those wounds and scars. And second, it shows us that flexibility is still an option and that we can, if we have a good partner to our problems, to our stupidities, to our regrets, maybe we can be in another place after we retell this story. By the way, you know, uh, you described the, the, the dilemma of uh, Vera, my protagonist, who was a real person. Her name was Eva Panich Nahir. She was uh, born in uh, Chakovets, it's a city in uh, Croatia. She belonged to a Jewish family. And when she was 17 or a little more than that, she fell in love with uh, an officer, a Serbian officer, non-Jewish. And it was a total love. And in order to keep his memory pure and not to allow anyone to dirt and to blacken uh, his memory, she, when she was confronted with the dilemma to go back home and be with her daughter, six years old, little Nina, or adhere and, and stick to the idea that her husband was not a spy against Tito. She, she chose the, the, the version that clean her husband. She said, nobody else will clean him or clear her, clear him. And someone will take care of her daughter. So she said, so it's, it's a really a story of such a dilemma and such a decision that very few of us luckily have faced in their life. And I always thought that after such a thing, 
such a crisis, such a terrible decision of a mother to choose not her daughter, but the sacred, the sacred memory of her late husband, that there will be no contact between the, the, the mother and the abandoned daughter. And here reality proved me wrong. I met Eva Panishna here, the old lady, and I met her daughter, Tiana. And they were, after years of crisis, but they were able to be together with empathy and love and forgiveness. And I, they taught me something, you know, here I can say that literature gave me a second chance. I did not believe in the option of recovery or healing. And, mm -hmm. and they taught me how it's possible. You told me about uh, this official story. Uh, I believe in one of your articles, you call it um, a visit card story. Uh, like, uh, I don't know, the story we like to tell when we go to a psychologist, like yeah. a self-protection story. Do you have such a story? I'm sure, I'm sure I have some stories that became my prisoners. Uh, probably even the need to make uh, interviews when there is a new book. Uh, inevitably, you start to repeat yourself. But I, <laughs> even when I, no, but I, might, I must tell you that even when I repeat myself, I'm, I, I will not say things that will not move me from the inside. And, and I don't want to, you know, to quote myself to death. And I will try to find new words to describe the old story. Uh, and of course, I have stories that I will not tell openly, that I will keep maybe private, totally private for me and for my family, but also for the next books. Because sometimes I feel that if I tell a private story too much, I will never be able to, to put it into, into one of my books. But are there stories that cannot be told? Stories that uh, refuse you, so to speak, that you could not write in your books? Uh, hardly. I, I, I think I try to, to, to write, not to publish necessarily, but to write everything that is primal for me. Uh, sometimes these things are, are horrible, are painful. Uh, sometimes the, I, I write something and I look at what I've written and it's like a verdict against myself on the paper. Uh, but again, because the power of the story, of the dialogue is so important for me, because so much in my life I progressed and I was educated by dialogue with people, by listening to other stories, to listen to my own text through their eyes and ears. And, and, and suddenly I learned so much. You know, for example, I, I wrote books about the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. and, and whenever I did it, it was difficult because I had to understand how a Palestinian, who is my enemy, how he observes the text of the conflict between us, how he observes myself, how does he see all the bad qualities that everyone turns towards his or her enemy. And maybe the enemy is the one who feels, before you feel it, to what extent the, the ugly qualities of an occupier have infiltrated into my internal organs. And maybe if we look at ourselves through the eyes of our enemy, it will not change us totally. It will not make us totally identify with the interest of our enemy, because our enemy is not a saint. Yes, they also have their mistakes and their crimes. But if we allow ourselves to look at our reality from his point of view, and, and usually the occupied see things that you do not want to recognize in yourself. If we do that, maybe even the conflict could have been solved much, much earlier. Uh, both your characters, Momik and Nina, live with pieces of stories. They fill the gap, that gaps, of course, the silence as best they can. The silence uh, of uh, Wasserman, the silence uh, of parents about the Shoah, the silence of Vera about the Gulag. But what we see in reality, uh, this is exactly what frightens them the most. Like the fact that Momik doesn't know about the Holocaust makes him anxious when he hears his father screaming at night. What are the virtues, if they are, of the silence, and what are the faults? Where, where does silence lead to? This is my question. I, I think that uh, for these two characters, for Momik and for Nina, 
uh, the silences are like hell almost because they feel that something terrible has happened there and nobody tells them. And they, with the imagination, the wild imagination of a child, they illustrate for themselves a picture of reality that will compensate for the lacunas, for the, the voids in their uh, life story. For example, Momik, who is eight years old, he keeps hearing from people around him in the neighborhood about the Nazi beast, Achaya Hanazi in Hebrew. This is how the, the Nazis were called in the 50s and 60s in Israel, and even today you will hear the Nazi beast. And he wanted to know what was this beast because he believed that this beast was like a monster or a dinosaur that used to rule over the country of over there. They always talk about over there, Sham, mm -hmm. Eretz Sham, the land of there. And, and he asks the, the grown up people, what was the Nazi beast? And nobody would tell him. So, so he goes to Bella, the owner of the grocery store, and he almost forces her to tell him what was the Nazi. He cries out and she says, because she doesn't want to pollute him with the knowledge, he's only eight years old. And she ironically says, the Nazi beast can come out of any animal if it gets, any creature actually, if it gets the right food and the right nourishment. And she says it with sarcasm, but he's only eight years old and he takes her very seriously. So he started to collect all kinds of small animals like a hedgehog and a lizard and a wounded cat and a raven and a doggy. And, and he puts them in cages in the cellar underneath the apartment of his parents who are survivors from the Shoah, from the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. and, and he hopes that from one of them, if it gets the right food and nourishment, the Nazi beast will come out. And then he plans to, to capture it and to, chain, to force it to change its ways. So from this expression that was such a mystery, the Nazi beast, I remember how I, as a child, when I first heard it, I was shocked. I was sure that there is such a beast and it's somewhere there and it's dangerous. But because of the silence that was imposed on him, he, he was almost suffocated in this silence. Mm -hmm. and, and because of that, he created the whole world made of rumors and whispers and fragments of conversation that were hushed down when a child entered the room. And so in this case, you know, the, the, the silence was also a very strong creative motivation. Uh, and and uh, well, there are places where silence is, blessing, is a blessing. I think we, we, we can feel it in relationship between individuals. Uh, when, and then of course, when you write, you know, when you create, there is a moment that you don't want to say too much. You have to withdraw because if you continue, you will tell too much, not in the meaning of a spoiler, but you will articulate something too much. So you have to withdraw and allow the silence to echo there. This is great. Uh, so this boy, Momik, released the Nazi trau trauma, you said, without ever being there and then. In one of your dialogues, I believe it was in Yellow Wind, you speak about uh, the Arab children saying that their birthplace is a village they actually have never seen, the place where their parents or even grandparents have lived in the past. So how does trauma pass from one generation to the next? Perhaps it would be better, I don't know, from one generation not to know what happened in the past? I am not sure it will be the best because after all, we are made of uh, the, the stories of uh, our parents and the memories of our parents. Uh, but of course, I think that it's, it can be very healthy to forget a little, not to remember too much, not to be totally paralyzed by the atrocities that have been done to your ancestors, to remember them, to know that they have existed, but to remember that you don't want it to totally block your life and your ability to, to, to breathe, breathe and to break through the suffocation of the past. We in Israel, we are now the third or almost the fourth generation after the Shoah. And it's interesting to see how this generation is so thirsty and yearning to learn more and more and to understand more and more how this could have happened. And there are trips who are going, taking high school uh, children to Auschwitz and Birkenau and some other places. And it's a very sensitive thing to find the equilibrium between 
describing mm -hmm. the, the hell in which they, they lived there during the time of the Shoah, describing the brutality and the cruelty of the Nazis and of their uh, associates and those who helped them. And at the same time, to remember that there were other options. There were people who risked their lives in order to save Jews. There were people who remained loyal to very strong, solid values of humanism. Uh, that we can choose, you know, that we can choose not to surrender totally to, to the, the pessimistic and even nihilistic uh, perception of, of the world. You know, there is always the, the question whether the mankind is good or bad. Uh, and and there, there is this phrase from the Bible, after God uh, uh, threw on us the flood in the book of Genesis and Noah built its, uh, his ark, of the ark of Noah. And then God said, I know that the heart of human nature is bad from the beginning. That human, yeah, that human being is bad from the beginning. And I thought, well, maybe God is right here. Not always he's right, by the way. But maybe here he is right. But he says only half of the truth. Because if there are good conditions, maybe the origins of man's heart can be good from the beginning. It depends so much on, on this, the environment, the circumstances, the education. Uh, and, and I think this is something, one of the lessons from, to, to learn from the Shoah. Uh, there's another common note in, uh, in the two books at the level of secondary characters. Uh, the torturer, Nigel, he's uh, yes. the commander of the extermination camp. He steals Wasserman's stories and writes them to his wife. Uh, he wants to look a better man and uh, to show that he's not just a murderer. Uh, in the other book, we also have the torturer from the island, a woman which has these moments of humanity telling Vera that she hopes she'll see her daughter again. I have always been fascinated like you uh, and scared at the same time by the mix of good and evil in the same person. Can, but can they really coexist? I don't know, is it a choice to be so and not otherwise? How does an ordinary person, like most of uh, Nazi and their supporter were, become part of such a mass murder system? Yeah, I think this is, a question that will continue to torment humanity until the, until the end, uh, because yeah. uh, people have both options. Yes, people can be evil and people can mm -hmm. be good. Now, may, I, I always feel that it's easier to be evil because you just join mm -hmm. something. And if you want to do good, mm -hmm. you have to initiate, to act sometimes against the nature of other people. But... Uh, well, it's, it's, it's really a heavy, a heavy question for a philosophy lesson. Uh, yeah. I just, I, I want to think for a moment. I think there is, there is always, a, the, it, it, it needs a whole system of education, of media, of political level in order to really expose people to the evil parts of them. Uh, usually normal people are not, when they are not sick or psychotic or whatever, they, they will not do terrible evil. But the evil is not only, you know, to go and to kill a whole family uh, or to do something of atrocity like that. But evil today is just to be indifferent. If you are just you mm -hmm. know, if you see a kind of a horrible injustice, if you see someone tormenting another one, if you, if you think of a distorted, terrible situation like Israel is occupying the Palestinians for 53 years, if you see all that and you turn a blind eye on it, if you don't, you don't want to look at it, uh, this is the, the new cruelty and the new brutality of, of today's. And it's so easy to be indifferent. It's so easy to detach yourself from a situation, to say, I saw nothing, I heard nothing. I don't belong to this reality. I don't want to do anything to, to have with this reality. And uh, I, I remember myself in, in, in several times in the occupied territories when I went 
And I, I was invited to see something like evacuation of a Palestinian village in the south of uh, the Hebron mountain. And there was a child sitting on a pile of mattresses. And I just, he looked at me, he was, I think, eight, nine years old. And he looked at me with such a desperate old man look. His gazes were so desperate and he was only a child. And I knew that if I look at him, I will never be able to forget and I will be totally committed to, to this question of the, the evacuation of the expelling of this little tribe for, from the places where they live. And of course I looked at him and of course I became committed because I think every normal man, when you see an injustice and you don't turn your head from it, you become committed. This is why people don't want to look at it. They don't want to be committed. And, and they prefer only to peep, to peep into the wound of another, not to really look, not to really, not really to be totally exposed to what they see in the wound of the other, because if they really look, most of them will not be able to shrug it, you know, to say, no, it doesn't belong to me. They will become committed. You had this image uh, in one of your book, uh, books, the children who play football and after Nazis come and take the Jewish children, the others, continue to play their game. It's a frightening image. It's yeah, like, it's I don't true. know, it's the a man... True story. Is, mm, it's like the, it's the man is dispensable in history, replaceable. The, it's like the man is, I didn't hear. Dispensable, replaceable in history. Nobody cares about him. He doesn't play a big, uh, I don't know, uh, He's, uh, he's too small for the great history. Uh, yes, there are people who want us to think like that. But I think all, all, my, all my work uh, as a writer, as an activist here, is to, to prove the other way around, that the individual is important, is essential. You know, there is this horrible uh, saying attributed to Stalin. He said, one death is a tragedy. Uh, a million deaths is uh, our statistic. And I, I always quote this horrible, horrible quotation because it, it is like a teacher for me, a guide where I don't want to be. I want to extricate the drama of the individual, the singularity of the individual from this dead idea, dead, dead metaphor of the dry statistic of Stalin. And this is, I think, this is the, the essence of literature. We even when Tolstoy writes about a huge war, he will write about two, three protagonists only. We are focusing on the individual, on the wonder of the individual and the multi-layeredness of the individual and the inner contradictions of him or of her. And, and by so doing, we really redeem him. We bring him back to, to, to life and to reality. And we do not collaborate with this terrible idea of every man is, in, is dispensable. Like the, the famous story of the, the person who, who murdered Bruno Schulz, the writer that I love. Mm -hmm. the Bruno Schulz, a genius writer uh, who lived between the, the, two, the two, after the first uh, uh, world war and, if, and in the second one, he was trapped or he, was became, he, he became like, a, a house Jew, like a servant at the house of a Nazi mm -hmm. commander in the city of Drohobic. And, and this commander had an enemy and the enemy met Bruno Schulz on the crossroads of Chatsky and Mitzkevich in Drohobic, pulled his gun and shot him dead. And he came to the employer, quote unquote, of Bruno Schulz and he told him, I killed your Jew. Very well was the answer. Now I'll kill your Jew. Now, when I read this story that maybe was only an anecdote, uh, you know, a rumor, not a true, but maybe, but it, it, it expressed something deep in, in, the, the, in that era. I felt I don't want to live my life in a world that allows such mm -hmm. monstrosities, such horrible options, like I killed your Jew, okay, now I'll kill your Jew, as if people are dispensable, as if we are talking about mm -hmm. a chair or a table. And, and all my being rebelled against it. And because of this sentence, I wrote uh, See Under Love, because I felt I want to write a book that will have so much vitality in it that it will shiver on the shelf, 
that it will be like one millionth of the, the imagination and the richness and the creativity of Bruno Schulz himself. Uh, in many places of your writing, just like now, you do this exercise of transitivity. You almost ask yourself, you ask yourself these questions. What would have been like to be in this man's shoes, even if the man was a bad guy? Uh, what is the use of this exercise? Here in Romania, for example, many of my generation who knew the dictatorship rather through their parents' experiences than through their own, perhaps uh, judging their silence, we ask ourselves this question. Would I have resisted in their place? Would I have been a dissident, a hero? Just like is the world built by heroes? Everyone has to answer this question for himself or herself. We cannot really know. Nobody, nobody really can know how he or she are going to mm -hmm. behave in, in such times. You know, like a soldier, before he goes at the first time to be under fire, he does not know how he will react. And, and many soldiers suffered from kind of a, a you know, battle shell, battle shell shock or shell mm -hmm. shock. Uh, or trauma because they suddenly suddenly discovered that they are coward, that they are just afraid. And rightly so, by the way, if somebody is shooting at you, I think it's a very reasonable reaction to be coward and to run away. But th they did not know it before. And so we are, whenever we approach a kind of a, a moral dilemma, we don't know how we shall behave. Yeah. And, and by the way, this is something that uh, Vera in my book and Eva in, in real life, she, she always tries to convince me and said, you don't know how you would have acted in front of such a dilemma that I face. And I told her, listen, I know how I would have reacted. It's not your way, but uh, I, I cannot really feel the spirit of the era, the zeitgeist in which she lived. She lived in a reality mm -hmm. where the, the ideas were more important than the human beings. And for me, such an era is a terrible era. Uh, in this book, Life Plays With Me, you take a step outside Israel, uh, but in another area deeply marked by conflicts, Balkans. There are, of course, many differences, but are there common traits of people who live their lives in such countries? I, I'm not sure. Can, can you, is there common traits of people who live in the same country? Who, in who such live country? their lives in such countries marked by conflict? Like Israel, like Balkans. Yes, yeah, 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 yes. Of course, every region has its nuances and character. Mm -hmm. But if you live your life in war, if you live your life yes. under fear, under existential threat, of course, you develop some expertise that are common to everyone, every human being in such a situation. And the strength of a society is measured by the ability of not surrendering to this gravity of catastrophe, of being all the time prepared for the, prepared for the next catastrophe of not believing in the option of having a future on starting to idealize ourselves and to demonize our enemy uh, in thinking that our conflict is exceptional and there is no other conflict like that in history so inevitably you, we cannot solve it all these things all these symptoms you can trace in every society that goes through a long state of war uh, everything you write is a return to the literary history. Uh, and if people were willing to see things from this perspective, through the eyes of a normal person, would that change anything in great history? For example, would that change the feeling of mutual fear that you are often talking about in Israel? Uh, it's a good experiment. Mm. I, I, will, I will not, I'm not able even to answer it. Uh, I think that we are marked so heavily, we the Jews, by our history uh, and our experience. And uh, for so many years, we were never at home in the world. And by the way, until today, Israel is meant to be our home, the place where we feel secured and solid and with the future. And yet it's not the home it can be. It's very much a home in, in many layers, but it's not the home that, that one feels when there are no dangers to him at all or to her. Uh, and, and I think, you know, sometimes I think that even if peace 
between Israel and Palestine and Israel and the Arab world, if it came yesterday, it always mm -hmm. it already came too late because of the things that were engraved in our mind, in the way we act, in our worldview. Uh, I think you pay a heavy price for living all your life under fear and in violence. Uh, and, and again, I will go to this idea of a home. For me, it is so essential to come to a reality where Israel will become this home. I think we really need this home to start to heal the traumas that we suffered from throughout our history. We need a place that, that we feel it is ours, that we have settled all the conflicts and, the, and disputes with our neighbors, that we shall see sequence of children and grandchildren, that all our perception of, of the time, not only of our past and present, but about us having a future, us living without fear, it is so essential for us and we are so deprived of, of this option. Uh, but to tell you the truth, I don't know if I will witness it in my lifetime. I don't know if it will happen. I don't know if the, the two parties, Israel and the Palestinians, will be courageous and clever enough to achieve peace and to fight together, to fight all those extremists who will try to assassinate the fragile peace. Uh, yeah, many questions. You spoke about fear. Uh, what does fear do to a man? Uh, it's a question, David Grossman. I also asked Ludmila Ulitskaya in Ismail Kadar, writers who, lives, who lived under oppressive political regimes. In Israel, of course, fear is from a different kind. It's not about dictatorship. But how can fear change a man, a human being? I think it narrows you. It really narrows you and you try to, to limit or to minimize the contact between your, your soul and the outer world because the world is dangerous, it's threatening, frightening, polluting. So you shrink, you entrench yourself, you become like, like an entrenched fist. There, there is a beautiful song by our almost national poet Yehuda Amichai. He says, even the fist was once open hand with fingers. And, and when you are afraid, you, you are a fist. The fingers entrench and you become a fist. And if you are a fist, then you do not really live life. It's very limited life. It's, uh, I, I, I think of this paradox of the Jewish paradox of a people who throughout our history, we survived to live our life and now we live to survive only as if we do not believe in the option of real life with many layers, with many prospects, with, many, with much uh, future. Uh, and, and fear limits you. You start to think in cliches. You are an easy prey for all kinds of manipulations like, di like dictatorship, like uh, xenophobia, like racism. Uh, I, I can see even in my country, but also in other countries in the same situation, when you, are, when you are afraid, there is a growing void and it becomes bigger and bigger void between the citizen of the country and what is being done in his or her name. Uh, and and uh, this void never remains empty because there are all kinds of uh, organizations or people with a very strict agenda. They pour in into this void into this valley, so to say, between the, the individual and what his country is doing. And they have a, usually a very fundamentalist or nationalist or extreme agenda. And they, they, they kidden up the situation and they kidden up us and they will kidden up the future of, of our children. This is why it is so important, you know, to fight, to fight for your ideas and, and not, not to surrender to to fear and to this narrowing down. Because many of politicians seem to be very good at speculating on people's fears. And it's very easy to manipulate people when they are afraid. When I, I look at Israel, we are, a, we are a traumatic society, community. We went through terrible things. It is so easy to manipulate us and to make us think that we shall live by the sword and die by the sword and that there is no chance ever in our fate 
there is an existential impossibility of us of us having life of tranquility of security of peace this is by the way why why it's so difficult to be a leftist in israel it's so much easier to be a right winger believe me you know when you are a right winger everything is organized in a very clear way we are the good ones they are the demons we have all the justice they have nothing uh, i mean it is my friend Amos also says you know that, that a man is born right winger because he's territorial because he's xenophobic because he adheres to his uh, parents and his family and suspect everyone else uh, in a way he's right Amos was uh, dear late Amos was right uh, and and it, it takes such an effort to act against this gravity of the narrow narrowness and of the surrendering to to a, a worldview that is so superficial what is your biggest fear well, there, are, there are some, listen, I'm an expert of that. Uh, one is not enough. But uh, right now, right now, not to talk about private family fears, mm -hmm. uh, of course, I mean, everybody knows what, what we wish for ourselves, what, we, what everybody wishes for himself or herself. But in a more larger scale, I'm afraid that Israel will not be the democracy that it should be. Already now we are less of a democracy because you cannot really be a democracy if you are occupying and oppressing another people for so many years. You, you must create in your brain a kind of a mental exercise that will deny and exclude half of the reality. And we Israelis, we know how to do it in a very efficient way, in an amazing creative way to cut, to buffer between us and our morality. And we regard ourselves to be a very moral people, but we make a dichotomy between this and what we actually are doing in the occupied territories. And this is hard to understand how this machinery uh, works. And, and there is inevitably an eating up of the, the, the infrastructure and the basis of our democracy, especially when we have a, a prime minister, Mr. Netanyahu, who is almost an expert and a genius in manipulating his people in making them think what he wants, in this melting uh, and breaking many of the institutes that are meant to buffer between a prime minister uh, and to, 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 to for, forbid the prime minister to become less and less democratic, like the attorney general and, and many other uh, important roles who are meant to, to keep and to protect the democracy. But is this two-state solution still on the table in Israel? Uh, actually, the, the one-state uh, solution, which means a binational state, uh, is popular among a very small minority of people. Now, it doesn't mean they are not right, but I still believe in the two-state solution. I think what both peoples, the Israeli and the Palestinians, what they desperately need is you know, to keep some distance from each other for some time, not to denounce each other, not to be hateful towards each other, but to mm -hmm. start to look into the society and not to the enemy or to the one who used to be the enemy. Mm -hmm. And to start, you know, to heal the conflict of more than a century. Uh, we need still a border between us and the Palestinians because there will be many who will try to, as I said, to damage this peace if it will be, but I don't think of a border in a form of a wall, a huge cement wall that exists now, but a border like between two neighboring states with as many gates and doors to allow people to commute and trades and ideas. Uh, and and I, I think these two peoples, the, the Israelis and the Palestinians, they grew up on hatred to each other for in, in the last century. You cannot take such people who were really manipulated and programmed to hate and make them a kind of a fruitful citizens in the same country. It takes time to heal this. Mm -hmm. It takes time to, to understand who we are, who they are, which are the, the meeting points between us and them. I believe deeply that when there is peace and when this peace will be established and become solid, we shall be surprised by the collaboration of the two peoples, by the way they, they work together 
and maybe even start to be curious regarding the other and how I, I believe that this piece can be a very fruitful and important and essential for both of us. I want to stay a little bit here onto the theme of the conflict between uh, human life and the great history, the political life. Uh, Aura, for example, my favorite character, uh, is a mother who is refusing to receive the news of her child's death. And she tries to live her life outside of it. But can a man really escape from a bad history? A man can have the illusion that he or she escapes. Uh, you can have, for example, in Israel, you can have now quite good life if you have enough money and if you have a job. And of course, everything today because of the coronavirus is very shaky. But there is a, a big layer of people who can really live good life and being at the same time totally detached, detached from uh, the reality of the conflict. It's not easy. By the way, even in the occupied territories, the settlers, the government built for the settlers a whole system of roads and tunnels and bridges that they can travel without noticing the occupied people. So uh, it, is, it is possible, uh, I think, you know, what's the point of, of being if you are not part of your time, part of the history of your time, part of the, the moral dilemmas of your time. Uh, it is, I, I think this is what humans are for, yes. Uh, otherwise, what is the life that you live if you just erase the important big questions? It doesn't mean that you can influence these questions or answer them, but at least ask. Mm -hmm. uh I believe that in all of your books, uh, literature, uh, non-fiction books, there are always there is always a family there, Aura mm -hmm. and her son, Tamar with her brother and their parents. Even though their relationship is somehow uh, dysfunc dysfunctional, Momik and uh, his uh, great uncle, Vela, Nina, Gili, the family is uh, is in every book. Uh, what does a family mean to you? What is a family? Uh, it's the basis. It's the place that I am known in the deepest way, maybe deeper than what I want to. It's the place where almost everything radiates something relevant for me, some things that I like, something that I dislike. Uh, it's, it's the place where I can decode the codes of almost everything. Uh, better than in any other uh, circumstances of mine. Uh, sometimes it can be suffocating, sometimes it can be supportive and uh, enriching. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, I, I think this is why, for example, the Bible is so fascinating uh, to read mm -hmm. even sometimes 3,000 years after it was written, you know, that it's so much, especially the first books and especially the book of Genesis, it's a drama of families. And uh, uh, I, I always have this story, this little story about uh, uh, when I was, I wrote a book called The Book of Intimate Grammar. I don't know if it's available in, uh, in Romanian. Sorry. And uh, it's yes. about... Ah, you have it in Romanian, good. Let me show it to you here. Wow. Yes. Wow, I see you really did your homework, Magda. It's Carta de Grammatica Interioare in Romanian. <laughs> okay, so you know, it, this book is, is about a Jerusalemite family, very symbiotic, very intrusive. Let's say it reminds a little my own family. And before the book came out, I thought it will be only fair to show it to my parents to prepare them before others are reading and going to read it. So my father read it and he said, well, David, it's a very nice story, but do you think that someone out of our family will be able to understand it? And I thought it's such a sweet comment because my, my books are translated to, to many languages and it, it makes me very happy that people are reading my books all over the world. But I want also that regarding every new book of mine, my father will ask, do you think that anyone out of our family can understand it? <laughs> and, and you know, whenever there is a new copy coming from 
uh, Slovakia now and China and uh, Norwegian. I come and I, I, I give the book to my father. He's now 94, clever and clear, very sharp. And I, I, saw, I show the book to him and I say, you see, Abba, they have understood. <laughs> At the beginning of uh, the pandemic, many of us expected to be reconnected with the essentials. Let's read more. Let's spend more quality time with our families. Let's get rid of the noise and uh, of the unnecessary from our life. Did, did uh, this happen to you? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, in the first phase of the pandemic, I had it. Suddenly there was silence. And suddenly I realized how noisy our life is. And I read a lot. I, 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 made, I, I made a kind of a decision. I wrote only for children and I read only books that are older than me. Uh, I, I wrote for children uh, in order to achieve some optimism. And I read elderly writers' uh, books uh, for sobriety, for knowing exactly what's going to happen. In the second phase, in the second wave, which started here something like three or four weeks ago, mm -hmm. it's very noisy. Uh, there are many demonstrations. There is a lot of political tension, animosity, and sometimes a feeling of almost anarchy in Israel. We are not there, but there is a, this flickering of anarchy, of even the temptation for anarchy that some people uh, surrender to. Uh, and it's, it's much harder to read and to concentrate. But somehow in surprise, like an unexpected pregnancy, I had an idea and I'm working on it now. Uh, and well, maybe a book will come out of it, who knows? <laughs> uh, at the political level, the pandemic uh, has brought a strengthening of uh, authoritarian political regimes. I'm looking at Russia or even Turkey. Are people willing to give up their freedom when they are promised security? I think you answered the question. They are promised security and security is a rare product today. And all the world is shaky. And the person who is the, the strongest in the world, Mr. Trump, his expertise is to make us feel more and more unsteady, to be doubtful regarding everything, not to trust truth. On the contrary, he, he spreads around him so many lies that you can really don't know what is true and what is uh, fake and lie. And he draws uh, pleasure from it, really. He, he, he gets kind of satisfaction from see the old order uh, breaks down. Now, I think there were many bad things about the old order and many, many people suffered and they were excluded from this order. But between that and, and, and what is happening now, there is a great gap. And this gap is, is dangerous. And the reality today, the, the shakiness of this reality is quite dangerous. Uh, and uh, yes, you know, people like, uh, okay, all, all the name of the dictators that I'm not going to mention, but they promise their people, they promise their people uh, solidity. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a kind of a way to understand or re-understand the world and to make the world relevant again uh, for them. Uh, but I think we have to be very suspicious because especially in such times of instability, there are more and more elements who are nationalist and fundamentalist mm -hmm. and racist. And we have to look at the situation and to write about it and to warn and not to collaborate with it and not to allow all those ele elements to fake our mind and to fake our language. We have to insist on nuances, not to allow those thick formulations of ourselves, of the situation. We have to insist on nuances and to revive the delicacies of every human, si human situation. This is the thing we are expert at. This is what we know how to do. You know, to observe a reality at a certain reality and to articulate it and to articulate it in a way that will insist on its nuances. And when you insist on nuances, you cannot generalize, you cannot stereotype, you cannot prejudice, you cannot become a racist. You are critical, you are open-eyed, 
and and please don't give up on this open idleness. to talk to in person even so by using zoom that i don't know which question to choose for the end of our conversation so i'm going to ask you about love you give love the ultimate power asaf's love for tamar in someone with uh, uh, to run with love, is love for nina uh, can love really hold so much on its shoulders uh, yes i think I think it's such a revitalizing uh, sensation and it's such a source of life, love, and it's such a, it's a wonderful way to act against the gravity of despair and of anguish and sadness. Uh, and I think whenever we are doing an act of love, not necessarily between couples, but also towards regarding our children, mm -hmm. our parents, our friends, there is such a feeling of, you know, we breathe with both lungs and we become bigger and more generous. And, and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a great gift given to us. Uh, David Grossman, if I were to describe you to someone in one word, I would choose uh, generosity, I believe. So thank you very much for this generosity in having this dialogue. And I thank you on behalf of uh, Polyron Publishing House on the bookstore of Timisoara and of course on behalf of uh, Romanian readers. I hope to see you soon in Romania. I'm, I'm sure I'll come when the pandemic is over. I, I think I'll start to travel again. And I, I was very glad to meet you and Reluca. And I'm, I'm sorry I didn't meet you, Anna. And I must say that what caught me immediately was the name of your store, the two owls. And I, uh, I'm very glad that I came and, and met the owls, the, the lovely owls, and, and to see the books behind you immediately, I felt it all. Thank you. Thank you. I think.